Chapter 1 of Sorcerers of Lomax Avenue Marcine choked on her own fright, cutting off the scream that wanted out. Two guards were lying prostrate in the hallway, one with his feet frozen to the floor, the other propped up against the wall. Marcine stood trembling, afraid to move her feet. What happened here? Should I tell someone? It was nearly midnight. Everyone in the fortress was either in bed or at the training grounds. More out of necessity than courage, she inched closer to the motionless guards until she finally got a good look at them. Oh, they're just sleeping. Her muscles slackened as she let out a sigh. But something still didn't feel right. Then it hit her. The guard sitting against the wall was directly across from her brother's room. It's just a coincidence. It has to be. She knocked on Loretho's door. No answer. He's asleep. He wasn't involved in this, right? This time she banged on the door. Loretho! There was a short pause before her brother finally answered. Marcine? Yes, it's me. I wanted to check up on you. Don't ever scare me like that again. Everything's fine. Go away, please. He sounded panicked, as if he was trying to hide something. How can anything be fine? I'm coming in, Marcine announced, turning the knob and finding it thankfully unlocked. No, wait! But Marcine barged in to find her brother standing in the middle of the room. The only light came from a lamp on the desk behind him, next to which lay his zephyr staff, as well as a large brown satchel made of some kind of animal skin. Clearly he was planning to go somewhere without me. Then Marcine noticed his left arm dangling lifelessly by his side. Loretho! You should not be here, he scolded. How can you say that? What happened to your arm? And why are there guards knocked out in the hall? Not so loud, her brother replied calmly. You weren't followed, were you? No, I don't think so. Good. Shut the door. Quickly. Marcine obeyed his request. When she turned back around, Loretho raised his right hand out towards her. Now move out of the way. Marcine leapt off to the side in a panic. Before she knew it, her brother cast an ice spell. A thick layer covered not just the door, but the entire wall. After a few seconds, he stopped, staggered around, and dropped into the desk chair. Marcine could see the spell took a lot out of him. She glanced at the frigid barricade. It must be at least three feet thick. There, Loretha said, short of breath. That should keep them at bay long enough. Who? Marcine asked. Loretha, what's going on? What happened to your arm? Why are you acting like you're in danger? Because I am, and not just me. You, the guild, all witches, even non-witches. This affects everyone. Even the unversed? What are you talking about? I wanted to keep it a secret, but I guess it can't be helped now. He dug, dug around in his robe pocket and fished out a sparkling red gem attached to a gold chain. The jewel glittered and dazzled as it swayed from side to side, catching the meager light in the room. This is the dragon scale gem. It has the power to summon a massive dragon, which, at the request of the summoner, would unleash fire and devastation on the entire world. So why do you have it? Because I'm trying to keep it out of Lord Dietrich's hands. Marcin laughed. You're telling me Dietrich wants to summon a dragon? I know what I'm doing, Loretho retorted. Dietrich wants to overthrow the council and conquer the world. He wants to eradicate anyone who's unversed. Marcin looked into her brother's eyes and realized he was being completely serious. Could Dietrich seriously consider doing such a thing? The more she thought about it, the more it made sense. He's always been obsessed with power, and he's always considered the unversed beneath us. Still to have such aspirations. So you're saying if he got hold of that gem, he could rule the world? Loretho nodded. But he needs to combine it with this tome. He opened the satchel and took out a large black book. 
On the front cover, Marcin recognized the symbols carved in and bordered by white lines, consisting of a triangle and circle encased in a diamond. She gasped. That's definitely his book of spells. Her skin felt prickly as she swiped it out of Loretho's hand. Where did you get this? I took it while Dietrich wasn't looking. You what? I had to do something. Lives are at stake. Like yours? Loretho, what were you thinking? So those guards, your arm... It's just a paralysis spell, Loretho said. It'll return to normal in no time. A small price to pay. Dietrich will do much worse once he catches you. Which is why we'll have to get these things safely to the council. Marcin's ears perked up. We? You mean, I'm going with you? Not much choice now. Loretho put the book back in the bag, then held out his effort to her. Here, you should take point. Reluctantly, she took the flying staff from him. It was colored a shiny gold, though she knew it wasn't actually made out of gold at all. In reality, it was constructed out of a metal that was hard as a rock, yet light as a feather. It had to be, since it was made for flight. The zephyr was in its collapsed form, not even the width of her head. She gave it a flick, and in an instant, it extended out to almost her own arm span. Two footholds unfolded on the tail end. Loretho went over to the windows and threw them open, giving her a clear view of the moonlit sky. A chill went down Marcin's back, but not from the Pacific night air. Wait, w we're flying out? Through the window? On top of everything else? Her brother motioned to the ice wall. Well, we certainly can't go out through the door. Marcin looked outside, first at the sky, then down at the trees far below the floating fortress. How far off are we off the ground? Hundreds, maybe even thousands of feet? I don't even want to think about it. She felt sick just looking. I don't think I can do this. You have to, Loretha replied. He dragged the chair over from his desk, forming an impromptu stepping stool. Relax, you'll be fine. Remember that training exercise back at the academy? Don't remind me. Marcine remembered perfectly. She and her classmates were taken high up, only for the instructor to throw their zephyrs over the edge and make them go get them. Supposedly, it was meant to train them for pressure situations, but it just made her feel worse. This isn't like taking off from the landing zone. There's no safety net this time. I must be crazy. She decided it was no time to get scared. Loretha was counting on her. She stepped up onto the chair and mounted the zephyr. Loretho took his spot behind her. The dragon scale gem hung around his neck, and the satchel hung diagonally across his waist and shoulder. He smiled as he placed his good arm around her waist. Ready? No. Suddenly there was a loud banging on the other side of the door. Loretho Ariada, called the muffled voice. On behalf of Lord Dietrich, I order you to open this door and surrender yourself now. Loretho muttered a swear just loud enough for Marcine to hear. Not good. We gotta hurry. Imbeciles, yelled another voice, which Marcine immediately recognized as Dietrich's. He's going to escape through the window. Circle around the fortress and head him off. I'll stay here and try to break through. As the ice began to crack, Marcine pushed off the windowsill. Here goes. Hopefully the zephyr isn't broken. Thankfully it wasn't. They were now flying, high above the trees. Marcine felt her nerves ease up as she watched her feet dangle below her. Her brother had his one good hand on his shoulder for support. Looks like the worst part's over. We're on our way now. And she heard Loretho cry out in pain, as if something struck him. Marcine felt the air rush out of her lungs, and she glanced back, fearing the worst. Something black pierced him from behind, and was now sticking out of his chest, coming up just short of her by mere inches. He was leaning back a little bit, as if he shifted on purpose to make sure the attack didn't reach her. The black tendril pulled out of him, retreating back through the open window. Loretho fell sideways off the zephyr, almost in slow motion, a sad, regretful look in his eyes. No! Marcine reached for him, but all she got hold of was the bag. She flew straight down after him, 
but even as fast as she went, she was unable to catch up to him before he disappeared beneath the treetops. Marcine stopped her descent and floated there for what felt like an eternity. He's just playing around. Any second now, he's going to poke his head back up and tell me he's okay. But she knew nothing of the sort was going to happen. She squeezed the front of the Zephyr so tightly it felt like her hand was going to break. Above, she heard a noise and looked up to see a bunch of guards approaching, swooping in from a distance. Then she realized she still held the bag with the book inside. Hurry! Get out of there! screamed a voice in her head. If you wait around, you'll end up just like him! Slipping the bag over her shoulder, she sniffed the tears back into her eyes and flew off as fast as she could, staying close to the trees. I need to lose my pursuers! She narrowed her eyes and concentrated, drawing a symbol for a smoke spell in her head. She willed the energy from her aura down her right arm, feeling it flow down to her hand, where silvery smoke poured out and trailed behind her. This gave her an opportunity to duck into the trees. Branches and leaves whipped at her face. She zipped this way and that, going faster and faster by the second. But she got careless, and it wasn't long before her zephyr clipped a tree branch, and she fell off. By the time she rolled to a stop, her body ached all over. With difficulty, she got to her feet and looked around nervously. No sign of the guards. I think I lost them. Actually, I think I lost my way. Where am I? Where's my Zephyr? She tried a beckoning spell several times, but none of them worked. Without knowing where her Zephyr was, there was no way to know which direction she should aim. The moonlight seeped through the trees in small patches. Should I use a light spell? No, better not risk it. Then she saw something hanging from one of the nearby branches. As she got closer, she saw it was a bag she grabbed off Loretho. As she pulled it free, the adrenaline wore off, and a horrible reality resurfaced. Loretho. She sat up against the tree, clutching the bag between her knees and her chest. No, 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 no. That was all she could think. Just that one word over and over, as if repeating it would somehow rewind time and undo his death. She pulled out the book and glared at it spitefully. You wicked, accursed thing! This is all your fault! She slammed it onto the ground. So many things I never got to say to him. I never even got to say goodbye. The sight of Loretho falling helplessly off the staff played vividly in her mind. What stuck out the most was the look on his face. As if he was saying, Forgive me, Marcine. I wish I could stay with you. What was that thing that stabbed him? That gross black tendril. And she remembered something she read in a history book about a kind of ancient forbidden magic that harnessed the power of darkness. Impossible. Could it be shadow magic? So that's why Dietrich sent the guards away from the door. He didn't want any witnesses. Marcine stood up. So that means I'm the only one left standing in his way. As she put the tome back in the bag, she considered going back for the gem. The idea of seeing Loretho's lifeless body made her sick. No. Besides, I don't even know where I am right now. And there might be guards waiting for me. She turned her attention to getting the book safely to the council. Let's see. It's to the east, right? So do I follow the moon or fly away from it? Suddenly, something flew past her left ear, narrowly missing. It was a purple sparkle, which Marcine quickly recognized as a standard disarming spell. I found her! Over here! shouted a voice coming from the source of the spell. She looked and saw one of Dietrich's guards standing a few feet from her. Two more dropped down close by on their zephyrs. Darn! Not good! One of the guards shot a large orange orb at her, which she ducked. The attack instead hit a nearby tree punching a splintered chunk out of the side. Marcine took off running, but barely made it two strides before she felt some kind of rope wrap around her. The binding spell snagged her arms and legs, and she fell forward onto the bag. The book punched her square in the gut, knocking the wind out of her. Her ribs hurt, and there was a faint ringing in her ears. By the time she recovered, the guards surrounded her. Marcine Ariada, said the one to her right, you're under arrest for aiding and abetting the theft of magical artifacts, as well as treason. Treason? Marcine growled. 
I'll show you treason, you imbeciles. Let me go. I'm afraid we can't do that, ma'am. Dietrich gave us orders to stop you and bring you back to him. And where is he? Marcine squirmed around, trying to get a good look at her surroundings. What, too busy killing innocent people like he did with my brother? Loritho Ariata was caught stealing and attempted to flee the scene. Dietrich had no choice but to use force. Force? You mean shadow magic? The guard had a surprised expression. I have no idea what you're talking about, ma'am. Loritho fell to his death. He was stabbed by a shadow vine. Saw it with my own eyes. Oh, and also, Dietrich is planning to summon a dragon and kill everyone. The guard looked briefly at his two cohorts, then back at Marcin. What exactly do you mean? What, did I stutter? Dietrich is going to combine this spellbook with a dragon scale gem and conquer the world. I was on my way to the council to prevent that before you messed it up. He stared at her quizzically. It was evident he didn't believe her. You can plead your case after you return to the fortress with us. We'll make sure of Dietrich's leniency if you don't cause any more trouble. He pulled Marcine up to onto her feet. One of the other two went over and tried to pull the bag out from under the ropes. Marcine felt humiliated, crushed, helpless. Everything Loritho did to prevent catastrophe, all for nothing. Then something bubbled up inside her, like white-hot rage, only different somehow. In that moment, she had no fear of Dietrich, of death, of anything. There was nothing left to lose. She managed to wiggle her elbow free and sent it hard into the first guard's gut, causing him to keel over in a daze. She felt the ropes loosen and shed them like snakeskin. She cast another smoke spell, blinding them momentarily. She ran right up to guard two, ducking under his reach and hitting one of his legs with a paralysis spell. He toppled over onto his stomach. Guard three dove for her. But she rolled out of his reach, zapping him in the back with a bolt of lightning. She caught a gleam out the corner of her eye. Lying in between two thin trees was her lost zephyr. Happily, she held out her arm towards it, casting a beckoning spell. The staff moved right into her open hand. She flicked it back into flight mode, and making sure the bag was closed, flew straight up. She didn't care which direction she was going. All she knew was that she had to get as far away as possible. As she soared upwards... She saw what at first looked like stars in the distance, but they weren't in the sky, they were on the ground. She realized they were city lights, laid out in an expansive rectangular area. This must be an unversed town. She visited plenty of towns like this during lessons and missions, but she never really got a chance to admire one in detail. The lights created a cascade of sparkly specks. For a brief moment, her agony and frustration were melted away, and she smiled. Suddenly, BAM! Something hit her square in her back. It felt like a bowling ball in both size and impact. She winced in pain, dazed, and regained her senses in time to find herself falling, her zephyr knocked away from her. Below her was a rushing river, and was coming up fast. She tried to draw another beckoning spell, but it was too late. She plunged into the river, feeling the cold rush stab her all over. A pained yelp escaped her lips. She sank all the way to the bottom. Her vision warped by the water. She was just able to make out her staff floating up out of her reach. The bag followed after it. She tried to swim after them, but she was weakened from her fall, and the current was carrying them faster than she could move. Her eyes grew heavy and almost seemed to close by themselves as if controlled by someone else. As she lay suspended in the water, helpless, the last thing she saw was a staff and book drifting out of her sight. Forgive me, Loritho. I tried. Then everything went dark.